Hey guys, welcome to episode four of Tech Talk. It is your girl, the Lab Girl, and we are back with a brand new episode. Um, before we get started, I'm super excited to introduce our next guest, but let's get into uh, some things real quick before we get the stream started. Okay, so for you guys who are already joining me, could you please just let me know if you can hear me okay um, in the chat? just to make sure that we have like good audio. And if you can hear me, then just uh, please just put like a thumbs up or just let me know, you know, I can hear you. Another thing too, you may hear my washing machine, so it'll stop really, really soon. So I just wanna make sure that I make that disclaimer, but um, yeah, let me know if you guys can hear me in the chat and we'll get started with the show. I wanna make sure that I uh, tell you guys, um, just about some some things that are going on. First of all, uh, we have had three episodes of Tech Talk, so I'm super excited about my guest today. And thank you guys for letting me know you can hear me. I'm super excited about my guest today. Um, but before we get into that, um, thank you so much, you guys, for watching um, and listening and streaming Tech Talk on YouTube. I really appreciate you guys. If you guys know that Tech Talk is created for um, Histotechs and other lab professionals to tell their story and just to, so I can get, so we can all help each other here in this histology community. Um, so if you would like to be a part of Tech Talk, definitely let me know. You can submit a email to me, which is at the lab girl circle at gmail.com. Um, or you can reach me on my social media platform, which is on the lab girl circle on Instagram or leave a comment uh, or your question on any one of my histology videos on my channel. So I always get back to you guys. Um, another thing is thank you guys for the 1800 subscribers. We're a little bit over 1800. We are definitely growing. Um, I really appreciate it. So if you are entering the live and you um, enjoy my histology content, definitely make sure to share my videos, thumbs up my videos so YouTube knows that you guys enjoy the content. And we will be getting to our guest in just one second. And let's want to make sure that I got everything ready for you guys. Today is going to be a very good show um, today. So I'm happy to see you guys back. And I'm so thankful that you guys are tuning in to Tech Talk. So, yeah, let's go ahead and bring on our guests. And uh, we can go ahead and get the show started. One moment. Hey, Joshua, how are you? I'm uh, doing well. How about yourself? Good. You guys, I would like to welcome to the stream uh, Joshua Greenlee, uh, Greenlee. He is the owner and instructor of Histology Education, and we are super happy to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining Tech Talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's great to have uh, one of these things for the Histotechs, uh, since no one knows who we are usually. So this is a fantastic way to start introducing new people to the profession. So thank you for doing all this work and putting this on. Thank Greatly you so much. Thank you. Now, the first thing I'd like to get into before we start the show is um, because I have a lot of new subscribers and followers to the Lab Girl Circle, I would like to know just a little background of how did you discover uh, my channel? All right. Uh, so I actually follow a couple of histology uh, groups on Facebook. Uh, as well as Instagram and some of the others. And uh, you actually did a tech talk with someone else and it was posted up in one of the Facebook groups. Uh, so I checked out your channel and uh, was uh, pretty surprised. Uh, I had, didn't know that it existed. 
Uh, and it was awesome. So uh, I think it's great to be able to give uh, the perspective and be able to share tips and tricks and all that sort of thing. So I went through a lot of your content, thought it was great and uh, reached out and said, hey, I'd be more than happy to to hop on and, and uh, do a tech talk with you. And Thank you were you. gracious enough to invite me to come <laughs> along. So Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you. I know you are, you definitely have a busy schedule. So we had to go back and forth and plan everything, but I really want to take the time to say thank you for uh, today and sharing your knowledge with, I know uh, a lot of people who will definitely be able to benefit from the show and, you know, and, and probably have a different outlook on histology. Um, if they want to enter the career of histology um, and we're going to, you know, cover um, a lot of different topics today. So I'm definitely excited that you are here today. So thank you so much for joining us. All right. All right. So the first thing, uh, Josh, is um, I would like to know, how did you uh, discover histology? <laughs> uh, by accident, like I think a lot of histotechs do. Uh, I was actually, I was going to college at Arizona State. And uh, like many uh, college kids, I needed to find work to make sure I could keep going to school. Right. Uh, so there was a local laboratory uh, that worked all three shifts. It's a very large lab. Uh, so it enabled me to work the overnight night shift while going to school uh, during the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually started on the other side of the laboratory with all the blood work and everything else. And I uh, saw all the cool body parts and tissues and everything else going oh, through cool. the door to the other side. So I was like, what's going on over there? And that's really when the <laughs> first time I heard about histology. And uh, I ended up uh, switching over to that department uh, as I was still going to school and just build off a of build off a of bill, became certified. And uh, next thing you know, years later, I'm still uh, involved with the histology industry. So uh, I didn't know what histo histology was before. I know, that's like the main question. What is what is histology? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, I think even the general, you know, population when we say, "Hey, what do you, you know, when they ask what do we do for a living and we say, mm -hmm. "Oh, I work in histology." Uh it's crickets chirping because they have no idea. <laughs> they have no clue. Yeah, or they start asking questions about uh, you know, history sort history. of thing. History. Yeah. I know. <laughs> that's like the main thing I um whenever I started histology, that was the main thing they thought I was probably like a history teacher. And I'm just like, no, it's you working in the lab and everyone's like, Oh, that's cool. I never knew that even existed. And I'm just like, yeah. it's a very good feel because if you are not someone who want that direct, you know, patient, you know, care, but you still have patient care behind the scenes, that may be a great feel, you know, for someone. Yeah, it, it really it's always been amazing to me because um, whether it's yourself, a family member, mm -hmm. a friend, you're going to know someone that's going to need a biopsy done at some exactly. point. Exactly. And no one knows what happens to it. It's like right. it, the biopsy gets removed and uh, it's like we're all Keebler elves and it just magically uh, diagnoses. Diagnosis, it. right. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, no one knows the the, the process that the process. it takes to... to uh, turn your tissue into something that the pathologist can read on a slide. I yeah. think we're, uh, when we get our blood drawn or that sort of thing, we're a little bit closer to it because, you know, we see the phlebotomist draw our blood and, mm -hmm. you know, and we assume that it's going to get put on a machine or something somewhere. And, uh, I think, uh, on the histology side, sometimes the biopsy is taken out when we're not even awake. Uh, we just, you know, wake up after some surgery or something like that. Right. And a few, few days later hopefully we get a diagnosis and which so, is hopefully uh, you know not anything you know yeah uh, yeah yeah I, that's the other amazing thing right because all, a majority of the work that we're doing could potentially result in a life-altering diagnosis mm -hmm. uh yet no one really knows the process that it takes to get there. So, um, and, um, and to add to that, I think that it's really, I think since I've been in the field, I think before I became a histotech, I wasn't really thinking about biopsies and having one. And, and it's funny because now that I am a histotech and then now when I think about, Oh, I may need to go get a biopsy done or something doesn't look right or something doesn't feel right. And it's just like, I want that same care be, that I provide to the patient. I want that care for my biopsy because now we know what, you know, what it takes yeah. to get that quality care and, you know, on the other end of your biopsy. So 
Yep. It makes and you think about things different, especially, for, like you said, for your family members, for your friends, or even just for someone you don't know. You may look at something like, man, like this doesn't look really good, you know, that, you know, that's sad. And then you're like, okay, but you want to make sure you take care, you know, of that biopsy from beginning to the end. Yeah, it's one of the few areas. I mean, it's it's called an irretrievable sample for a reason. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if, if we need to, someone drops a blood tube in the laboratory, okay, we can go draw a new tube. Of draw blood. blood, right. Something happens to your biopsy that may have been the only mole or right. the only, you know, polyp or whatever the case might be. That area of interest may be locked in that one small piece of tissue. And if anything happens to it along the process, you know, someone may not get the diagnosis uh, that they need or start mm -hmm. the treatment they need. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's something that uh, I think we're it's always locked into our head, right? That we got to right. always remember the patient that's on the other side. Uh, even in veterinary, there's someone's, you know, dog I know, or, someone's pet. I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you the, want they're that they're the, the furry treatment. family member. I know. You can't forget about those. You definitely want that same treatment for your, you know, for your pet. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you guys, we're going to get a little bit more into uh, Josh uh, Josh's website, which is histologyeducation.com. Um, thank you guys for joining the live um, today. Any questions that you may have for Josh or myself, please leave them in the comment and we'll do a Q&A later today. And if you're watching us on the replay, definitely thumbs up and let YouTube know again that you enjoyed this content and this content was beneficial. So what we're going to do, Josh, uh, I'm actually going to bring up your website, um, histologyeducation.com. And I thought it'd be good because we can do a little bit more like interactive because I was able to uh, skim over it and um, saw some really good uh, things that you are offering um, on histologyeducation.com. Uh, so while I bring that up, could you tell us a little bit more of what made you um, decide to actually focus on building a website and what is the goal behind this website? Sure. Yeah, so I, I've been in histology or within the histology industry for now, the laboratory overall for well over 20 years. And uh, I'm a histotech as well. I'm HT and HTL certified. And uh, we need to have that continuing education. And it's not uh, always the easiest things to find. There are some good resources that have become that been growing and coming out more. Uh, mm -hmm. But even a lot of the ones that offer continuing education, it's not always geared towards histology. So, you know, it, it's great. It counts for your certification to learn about blood bank or micro or some of these other things. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, most of us want to learn something that's relevant to us. So um, there are some limitations on where you can find some of that material and that, that you can find it affordably and that you can find it where you can access it really at any time. And uh, there are so many new, hopefully new people um, or inexperienced folks that are trying to break through and get into histology because of the staffing shortages being uh, what they are. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, another one of the things that I, I'm working on right now to hopefully release, release soon is uh, um, a program for those who are studying for the histotech exam. So uh, that's not up yet, but it's, uh, it's coming soon. It's actually in the process right now. Cool. Um, I think um, whenever I uh, saw your website, I was thinking like, you know what, this would be something good for um, our guests to see because we can tell them, you know, hey, you know, check out this website. But I thought, you know what, I think it'd be a great idea. I know everything is probably not complete on your website. So but this will be a great um, in addition to um, whatever they're studying is or whatever. Um, as far as like a, a good addition to a uh, career, if they want to choose histology, just some, a good resource for them to actually see. So let me go ahead and bring up the website here. And then if we can just uh, go through it, um, I see if I go to, let's go ahead and go to um, the blog. Um, I thought the blog was uh, brilliant. Um, it looks like it says histology education loves pathology and yeah i i like my little acronym so yeah i thought help uh was a good uh, acronym for that and uh yeah the whole purpose of the blog and this is something this is a part of the the free resource that's on the website mm -hmm. uh you can you, you don't you can go right to it uh you don't have to even be registered uh, or you can register and all this is accessible for free and um what i like to do here are some things are tips and tricks some things are just you know, what is histology? Um, 
uh, talking about employee burnout, uh, some of those sort of things. Um, so just some resources to go to. I usually uh, share these on my social medias when they come out as well. Um, but it's just something, it's a resource for, you know, histotechs, uh, maybe just interested in something that's going on in on the industry. Um, I hope to do some um, neat uh, kind of innovation sort of things on here as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so the blog is one of those things people can go on and access it uh, for free. You don't even have to log in or register with the website uh, to do so. So this is a uh, uh, I'm trying to get them on there kind of as much as uh, as I can in terms of at least a, once a month. I'd like to get to to the point where I'm getting them up there uh, every couple of weeks. Uh, and I'm trying to kind of recruit some folks that would like to write their own uh, blogs for it as well. So uh, wink, wink, if there's anything uh, <laughs> you uh, uh, are interested in uh, providing a topic for at some point, uh, I, I'd be happy to, to talk about it. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I mean... Um... It's just, I mean, as far as, cause I know I do a lot of video content, so I definitely um, can see myself, you know, maybe in the future, you know, writing something. I wanted to go over something that was really caught my eye and I was like, okay, like this is a really good piece. Um, it says, finally, we should recognize and appreciate the work of histo technicians more. Their contribution to healthcare is immense and they deserve recognition for the crucial role. Histo Technology Professionals Day was started in 2010 and is celebrated every March the 10th. That was a good start toward recognizing the profession, but there's still work to be done. That is the world of histology in a nutshell. Whether you're a seasoned histotechnician, an aspiring student, or simply intrigued by the world of histology, remember each tissue sample has a story to tell, and histotechnicians have the unique privilege of helping to decipher it. Histology is an interesting and rewarding field, and we can all play a part in encouraging others to be a part of it. Um, that really stood out to me, that part, because Sometimes whenever we get into that everyday, you know, routine and, you know, we get caught up in us having a busy day and, and just ready for the weekend and, and you know, whatever is going on in the lab. I thought that was really important um, that you wrote that because we need to remember patient care is priority, but also, too, you know, we also should take pride in what we do, too, because what we do is really special. And we do want to um, try to get more people to know the field of histology. So, um, and I don't get paid, you know, anything extra to do this. So I feel like in, in you know, just, to, just for me to actually, you know, bring awareness to histology, I'm very happy uh, to be a part of that. So I really enjoyed uh, reading that because it sort of like lets me know like, hey, like I'm important too. Yeah. And, and I, we need we need a lot more people uh, like you uh, to be able to to spread the word because it is it's not necessarily a uh, you're not getting a lot of benefit mess for it. I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. you spend a lot of time putting your content together yeah. uh, and it looks great. Uh, you. So you're kind of doing it for the benefit of of the industry and hopefully mm -hmm. the people that are are looking at doing it. And we we need a lot more of that because. Um, the staffing shortage has been an issue that's been going on for, you know, a couple of decades. Um, I'm getting ready to prepare a poster presentation for NSH about, uh, you know, the short staff situation and that sort of thing. And, you know, you can find articles going all the way back to 2001, 2004 about the histology and the histotech shortage. Uh, and COVID just ramped everything up to 10. Uh, there's a lot right. of burnout. Uh, so a lot of people, you know, left the industry or uh, just, you know, uh, a lot of pressure uh, to to do a lot of very detailed things. Uh, and, you know, we can't rev those engines at, you know, 110 percent all day, every day without uh, eventually feeling some burnout. So um, we need people to to join the industry. We're still at a rate where retirements are outpacing the new techs. I know. Okay. I just read something recently that in like one of the last years, because New York has a separate licensure uh, in, in addition to the normal ASCP, uh -huh. uh, and one of the years, they nine, nine new licensed techs in the state of New York. In, in a one year? year? It, yeah, in a whole year. So wow. you, you imagine that's not, that's that's not, not enough. filling the gap. Uh, no. uh, I, I, work, I go into labs sometimes who have, you know, four or five open positions themselves, let alone you know, for an entire state uh, to have uh, nine oh, new nine. in a in a year, um, you can that kind of 
explains the gap that we're trying to fill in order to get new people in. And um, it's like you said, it, it's it's a really important uh, job. Uh, there's a lot of pieces and parts of the process uh, that other areas of the laboratory don't have to do. And it requires human resources and people to be there to be able to do a lot of this important work. So yeah. um, that's why I said we, we need more folks like yourself who are willing to uh, take their own time and effort to try to get the word out um, that histology exists. We're not right. Keebler elves. And uh, and it's really- We're important. not the Keebler elves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's no, right. there's no ma magic biopsy tree or something where people go to get their work done. It's, it's all people um, working in the lab. I think too, because I do uh, live in California and I, and you know, just like New York is some, it's a place where it's really expensive to, mm -hmm. to live. So I think probably, um, you know, one of the shortages can possibly be because, you know, when people think of California, when they think of New York, they think like the cost of living. So, yeah. you know, you definitely would need a great pay to offset so you can be able to afford to live there. And I think that's why I... I try to suggest traveling because at least if you can, you know, visit and you can travel and you can do an assignment somewhere, then, you know, most of these companies are willing if you want to stay on, like, and if they really need the help, they probably have a, you know, a, a, you probably have a better chance of saying, you know what, I would love to stay here and I would love to be a part of the team. But, you know, this is what the pay I need for me to be able to probably to like literally like live and afford, you know, be able to be able to afford to live here. I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, a lot of people, and plus to the second license, because I know New York, Nevada, in Florida, they have the separate, um, the state license that you need. And I, I mean, this is just, you know, what I've heard is that New York trying to get the state license is a little bit more harder, mm -hmm. um, than I think Florida and Nevada is, but I mean, I really, I haven't applied for New York license, but could you confirm that the process is, you know, different? Do you have to take another test or? Yeah, they, they have, I mean, the ASCP is, is, uh, one part, but yeah, they have their own, um, process and and own test and that sort of stuff that you have to go through that process in order okay. to be uh, considered certified and to work in New York. So uh, okay. that's one of those areas where, you know, it's uh, there's a challenge to become certified in general. And then yeah. when you have to go through those additional hoops uh, in right. some of those states. Uh, you mentioned Florida, too. You know, yeah. uh, the, the education materials that I have on here for courses, I have to make sure that they're registered with CE Broker. Mm -hmm. uh, because if they're not registered with CE Broker, then the residents in Florida uh, can't uh, use them uh, for their uh, for maintaining CE. their certification. Yeah. So, yeah, there are a few states that have uh, kind of additional wrinkles uh, you know, or processes that you have to go through as a histotech. Uh, to be able to be certified and work in the laboratory. So it does make it a little bit more difficult. And then add in the fact that, you know, California, states like California, Texas are a little bit lucky because they have more than one histology program in their state. Mm -hmm. But uh, overall, uh, there's actually almost half the states in the country don't have their own histology program. So that's probably contributing to the lab shortages as well, because there's not a lot of programs that you can actually go to. Yeah. Um, whether if it's like, you know, because you're trying to balance probably like working um, and going to school. So do you think um, maybe if more hospitals or laboratories, um, I see that a lot of maybe promoting within, you know, as far as like lab techs to histotechs that can probably solve um, more of the uh, the gap or the need for histology um, in your in your lab, because once those lab techs go and become a histotech, if they have like a training program within the facility, then you really just need to probably hire just for lab techs because you, it'd be like maybe just like a promotion from a lab tech to a histotech. So do you think maybe that would probably help some of the shortage as well, as well as offering uh, more programs in that city or in that state? Yeah, it, it's it's something that a lot of laboratories or large hospital systems are going to now, mm -hmm. uh, especially if they are already kind of part of a, a educational system too, uh, mm -hmm. where they call it, they're basically home growing their their techs, right? Right. The problem though with that is that a lot of the times the laboratories are home growing their techs because they literally can't find qualified techs outside. Oh. So out of desperation. They're like, hey, lab tech, <laughs> let's <laughs> these things. 
But the issue there is that sometimes that training is done very um, specific to that one laboratory. Okay. And a lot of the times they don't necessarily have a lot of time to do the full in-depth, you know, detailed training of the chemistry and all of the background that goes along with histology. Right. So the lab techs become, uh, you know, workable techs for the laboratory, mm -hmm. uh, but their troubleshooting skills are sometimes lacking or they've learned enough to be able to do the job uh, at that laboratory. But if they were to go somewhere else, they would have a kind of a steep learning curve. So it's great. And a lot of these laboratories are doing it out of necessity because there's really no other place to do it. But it's it, you miss some of that. And you lose some of that when someone doesn't get the actual time and uh, real background and education. Yeah, real hands on. I mean, I think um, with school and I actually agree with you because I think like just say if it was 100 percent a lab tech transitioning over to a histotech, probably I would say maybe a good like 70 like it's maybe 70 percent probably will actually maybe get it but like you said they'll be lacking certain things mm -hmm. that they probably could learn in school and with school um they you know most of the schools have like hands-on training they have a built-in laboratory uh, or a lab you know within the school you have enough time to figure out fixation um you know mm -hmm. processing um special stains uh and as well as like seeing it real time and you're able to, and you learning with other students and you have that time to actually like, and the main thing is the book. Whenever yeah. you are, I think that's that key component, honestly, that you'll be missing is Frida Carson. Because yeah. when you're in school, you have that book, you're actually learning from that book. You actually have to read the book. You actually have to do the questions in the book, the workbook. But when you are transitioning from lab tech to, um uh lab tech to hist histotech that key component is that book is missing and then what happens is you just only need the book to pass the ASCP but you're not really learning and understanding like okay like this is the reason why in technical notes it says to do this and you you'll learn it eventually like by trial and error but i think that key component is probably free that that's missing yeah there, there's the it's the little nuances and little details mm -hmm. so you know, I, I've talked to some laboratory techs or histo techs that have kind of grown up through a system somewhere. And mm -hmm. uh, you talk about fixatives and fixation, and they may know formalin very well. Right. But they don't realize that there's actually a whole host of other types of fixatives and what uh, and the importance of that. In fact, we take mm -hmm. fixation for granted a lot uh, because that's one of those. Because we're so elements. used to formalin. Yeah. We're so used to, or maybe alcohol or something like for the smears or like we're so used to like those one or two things that we see you're yep. absolutely right and yeah and, and your lab, like my, big chapter yeah exactly your and your lab that you're at maybe maybe they don't do a lot of different types of special stains or right. you know maybe maybe the lab that you're at you know you're you it's it's you've never done manual stains or right. maybe you only you send those out and you don't do them at all so there right. are little pieces sometimes that are missing if you're only learning from one spot. And the other challenge to that too, and I think this is also kind of where um, the traveling histotech is kind of a benefit, um, with there not being a lot of programs out there, uh, there are a couple that have popped up that allow for distance learning. Uh, oh. I think there's one in uh, North Dakota, and I, I there's a longstanding one, I believe, out of Indiana that's been really good. Uh, but those programs also have to work with wherever those students are to, to uh, find an internship. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the problem with a lot of these laboratories being short, so short staffed, they don't have time to bring students on and do the, do them justice and to right. train them right. So if you can't have an externship site or you can't find an externship site for someone, then they can't and uh, have those people come into the programs. I so, get that yeah. all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I get those questions. Like I just recently, I got a guy uh, who reached out to me. He said, I'm doing the program. I don't want to feel like I'm doing it for nothing because now it's time for me to do my clinicals. I have to wait and try to find yeah. a clinical site. And then I'm just like, you're like stuck between a hard place, a rock and a hard place. So I'm just like, yeah. because it's like I don't want to, I've done this for nothing. But I was like, well, do you work at a hospital? And he's or at a lab already. He's like, I do, but I don't work in histology. 
So yeah. I guess I don't. So he's looking to try to find a clinical site. But you're right, especially during um, and after COVID or when COVID was happening, it was kind of hard for you to, to you for you to be placed in a lab because of COVID. So yep. that's true. Like you're right because if you're already short staff and you're looking for a clinical site, do do you have enough staff to actually take the time to train or to you know? to put the students, you know, in a good space to where when they're coming to a lab, they feel comfortable enough and not just feel like, you know, they're just there just to file blocks or just do the little things that you need, but yep. they're getting the training that they need because then they walk away feeling more confident and, you know, knowing that, hey, I actually like apply my skills that I learned in school and that that may hinder them. Yeah. It becomes almost like a negative feedback loop, it right? Does. Because the laboratories are so busy because they can't find qualified staff, so mm -hmm. they can't take on students. Well, right. if they can't take on students, then the student doesn't have their externship site, so then the program can't take them on. Right. So then that means there's fewer people going to the program, which means there's fewer qualified techs. So right. it's this kind of downward spiral. Uh, the way some of the traveling techs work in is maybe they were in a state that actually had a good program or an established mm -hmm. program, and they were trained and had their externship site. Then they begin traveling and maybe they go to some of these rural areas or these states that don't have a local program. And mm -hmm. like you said, maybe they really like it there and they decide to stick around and stick. Uh, that's right now, unfortunately, kind of one of the only ways we can get some of these folks, these histotechs from areas that have good programs that can mm -hmm. go through and get educated uh, and to fill gaps in these states that don't have a program at all. That's uh, how she did because every state has hospitals and labs and everything right. else you need histotechs, you know, where do you get them if your state literally has no program? Has no I'm, program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm in Arizona. Uh, we have uh, one program for the whole state uh, through uh, Phoenix College, which is part of the uh, Maricopa Community College District. And I actually mm -hmm. uh, had the opportunity, I had the privilege to, I taught for about four years in, in the program. And even for, for us, for that program, I, you know, a lot of the times my students were folks who were already working in a laboratory that were wanting to be certified. So they become supervisors or maybe move to another laboratory or potentially even move out of state. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't even always have a lot of fresh meat. It was always people, you know, a lot of the times it was people that were already working in the industry. Gotcha. Uh, so, you know, I, we, even that, even how they have in the one program, there was limitations on how many people we can bring in because externship sites. We had yeah. to get people to be able to do it. So um, the traveling techs kind of almost can fill a little bit of that gap because mm -hmm. they may travel to an area that doesn't have a program and kind of fill in. So, yeah, I think. Um, and also, too, um, as far as like the benefit of traveling, because whenever I started, um, I started in um, a lab and then I wasn't getting the it was my first job and I was thankful for it, but I saw myself just doing um, frozen sections a lot because I would go later in the day. So now I'm looking back, I'm like, that was actually great that I was only doing frozen sections because, but I never got to cut like priorities. And, you know, those, the main tissue would be like the GIs and the derms and that would be gone by the time I get in. So most of my afternoon would just be, um, immunos which now i'm now i never now i never do immunos but i do i do manual ones for for brains and and stuff like that but um but i used to do like a lot of uh immunos and i used to do um a lot of frozen sections and i'm like i want to do something else like i'm missing out on the general stuff on the general stuff and then i get a job at a derm lab and like it's only just two of us. And then I end up, you know, I was not confident because I never got to, I didn't even know how to embed derm good. I'm like, oh my God, like, how can I even get this job? I, I'm never embedding. I'm never embedding. So I wanted to perfect my embedding skills. I knew how to do a frozen, but I feel like I didn't feel confident in just doing the regular work. So I took a chance and I left and I went to derm. And when I went to derm, I started doing Mo's frozens but because i had already had the experience in 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 um frozens then i was, I was taught mo's then i was doing frozens and then i was doing every type of derm specimen and then from there i'm like okay and then when i started traveling i felt like you know that 
actually broaden, you know, my work history and broaden my horizons. And I'm just like, okay, well, let me travel. And then I will go somewhere to where everything was done uh, as far as the lab techs would do. I wasn't used to having lab techs. And so it's just because I did every single thing in my derm office. I, I grossed. I, you know, I, I did embedding, I cut, I stained, I did from the beginning to the end and did modes and did frozen. And then when I get to a, a, a hospital, I'm like, oh, it's sweet. We have lab techs and that, you know, you know, and then they're, they're putting the blocks in my thing for me and they're, and they're making my slides and it, but everything was manual, like I was used to doing. And then from there, then now where I'm at now, everything is automated, but then now I'm back to a manual part of it. So I think it just, made me a well-rounded tech and I'm still trying to learn and do new things. And, but I think if you are a student or you're someone who, like you say, if you can be a traveler, then you can go to different sites and be able to expand your resume, expand your career. And, you know, if you feel like you're not the best embedder or you feel like you're not the best cutter, or you feel like you want to do something different and you can't get that in the city or state that you're in, it will be a good opportunity for you to be a traveler and go somewhere else to where you can, you know, build yourself and build mm -hmm. your, you know, your resume. Yeah. And I think you touched on something that was really good there, which is how uh, versatile uh, histotech and that, and that profession uh, really is. Right. You know, a lot of the times when we talk about histology, we instantly think about, oh, the basic embedding, whatever tissue and that sort of thing. And uh, it's really easy to get your blinders on and think that's the only option we have. So for mm -hmm. the new people that might be becoming histotechs, there's actually a ton of different things that you can do within histology. There's obviously the basic, there's, you know, the hospital laboratories that are doing surgicals and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But then there's the specialty labs, like you mentioned, whether it's derm labs, GI labs, where you mm -hmm. may be doing MOs and frozens that you may not do in right. a hospital laboratory. Then there's, you know, pharma there's research, there's mm -hmm. neuro labs where you mm -hmm. might be doing, you know, brain and, and nerve. Uh, and muscle. Yeah. And muscle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Enzyme histochemistry. Is enzyme not his oh God. Yeah. Learning enzyme histochemistry. I, first of all, like <laughs> when I think about neuro and I think about general histology, like I'm just like this night and day, <laughs> like doing the yeah. enzyme histochemistry and, uh, and doing, and, processing, you know, or cutting, you know, frozen sections and then cutting a muscle specimen on the little, on with the gum. And I'm just like, what did I get myself into? But I wouldn't have been able to get into that and do that if I wouldn't, you know, have taken a chance and actually like, like, okay, like this is something new, but you're right. There's so many different avenues and fields yeah. other than what we just see in the general histology yeah. setting. You know, some, some labs are doing, uh, you know, electron microscopy. So mm -hmm. you learn that. That's a totally different type EM of and IF. Yep. Yeah, IS and the uh, IHCs, molecular mm -hmm. is growing. Molecular. Now yep. we're working, looking at laboratories, you know, doing digital imaging and next yep. gen sequencing. And then those are all just the variations between different types of laboratories. And then you have different types, completely different types of things within the industry. So right. there's, we talked about a little bit earlier, right? There's the human side. But then there's also the veterinary the side. Veterinary, you know, yeah. you know, dogs get tumors and things like that too, mm -hmm. and cats and and that. So there's a whole a wing of histology that just deals with pets and animals. Right. There's the research side that doesn't do anything with patients, but like clinical you know, trials. Yeah, they're like developing drugs or processes and things. And then even outside of that, you know, being in the laboratory and everything is great. But then, you know, for example, myself, you know, I transitioned at one point over to the vendor side because yeah. people forget that the people that design this equipment need that right. expertise as well. So uh, I had started back in college way back as more of a, on the engineering side. So now in my, in my role that I had had on the vendor side, now I'm actually being able to, you know, look at, well, what are the things that the machine should be doing that it's not doing now? What oh. are the things that could help the histotechs do this safer or easier right. or better protection for the tissue for the patient or, or quality, whatever the case quality, be. quality. Yeah. Quality. So there's that whole realm that you can branch into as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks that uh, may work on the, the vendor side uh, as a histotech, but they're doing all the training. They're doing all the, that sort of thing for the new instruments that come in. So 
when people come into histology, um, you know, it's really easy to get stuck in like, man, do I want to do micronomy for my whole career? And you don't have to. I mean, I I had a cool uh, opportunity to be able to talk to some folks that work in like the zoo and and even uh, one of the more recent ones, an aquarium, and they have their own histotechs. Really? Because, yeah, because you, you got to take care of the animals at the zoo. That's you got to cool. take care of the dolphins and marine life at some of the aquariums. Uh, so, yeah, That's there's so a funny, yeah, though. there's a lot of different, um, you know, vectors you can kind of shoot off on with your knowledge from histology. And like you said, you know, traveling text is a great opportunity to be able to uh, broaden your horizons, as you mentioned, and learn a lot of these little things because, if you are in just one laboratory, you really get used to doing that process right. for that laboratory really well. But sometimes we get in that bubble and we don't see all the other cool opportunities that might be out there uh, as well. So yeah, I agree. Histology, yeah, histology is not just embedding blocks and and slides. There's a whole realm. Right. That it's a whole realm. Yeah, I yeah. and I think and I mean. I give it up to people who just because it's some people who are just comfortable with that just everyday, you know, routine, which is great because we need we need those people, too. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah. So who wants to just who's okay with just coming in, cutting and embedding, Uh, especially like a lot of retired um, people or people who are about to retire. You know, they've been in that hustle and bustle for all these years. And, you know, it's good when, you know, they can see probably like a more, you know, histotechs come in because they're soon be leaving. And I I know a lot of retired people, they normally retire, but they come back and they help out, you know, the newer histotechs. And they actually have that little bit of, you know, time to actually show them how to do specials or how to show them how to, you know, cut or how to embed better. And, And I feel like when, you know, when you see new people, because, you know, by me, being a traveler, I was a a traveler. I think I was maybe permanent for like maybe a good year. And then I started maybe a year and a half and I started actually traveling. And, um, you know, just what I see now, because I've been in, you know, this field for like seven years, what I see now is that um, when you get travelers or you get new histotechs and you're right, when you are, you know, so busy and the lab is just needing to run, um, you sort of don't want to, forget that because they are new. They are, you know, they get wrapped up in trying to maybe keep up with the speed and keep up with this and try to, you know, make sure that they don't make any mistakes. And, you know, but I feel like sometimes we can forget about that new person or forget about that traveler and just think, oh, you know, they got experience. They used to work somewhere else, but, you know, every place is different. Yeah. And we need always nuanced processes. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to make sure when you just said, when you, when you touched on, um, you know, you may be working at one lab for a specific amount of time, so you're used to it. But people have to understand that I may work at this lab, but when I go to another lab, my skill set, yes, can come with me. But that's a whole different environment. And I'm learning, you know, their way, their rules, their protocols and how their lab is ran. So I can't take that, you know, that that type of like, well, she knows what she's doing. She got it. No, because I want to make sure I'm doing it to the quality of this lab. Yeah. And that that uh, really touches on an important thing, too. And uh, having a perspective and being open to being able to do things different is Mm -hmm. so important when it comes to the laboratory. Um, I'm also a a lean certified Six Sigma black belt as well, too. So uh, a lot of the things that I work with. Can you explain what that is? Because I don't know. Sure. Yeah. So uh, lean and Six Sigma are two different uh, methodologies. Okay. Uh, that you can use to examine processes for continuous process improvement. So okay. lean is looking at uh, waste and areas of waste. So mm-hmm. for example, if we wait for a really long time until we have two, 300 cassettes ready to go on a processor, all that waiting time is potentially waste because oh. some of the stuff's fixed. We could have had it processed, but we're not. We're waiting right. and we're batching. You know, we could save a lot of time by eliminating that waste. Okay. Six Sigma, it looks at variations and processes. So let's say you're a really good embedder mm-hmm. and, a, and a micronomist gets your batch. They whiz right through it, right? Because everything's right. on the same plane. They don't on have to stop plane. what they're doing. Minimal. Yeah. Thing. Let's say I'm not a good embedder. And now the micronomist gets my batch. They have to stop. They got to stop. You know, the time that micronomist takes to do their process is completely mm-hmm. different whether they got your blocks from you or me. So right. that's variation in the process that we want to 
uh, reduce in order to help the overall outcome of the process. So a lot of the times I go into laboratories to look at their workflow and to look at how things may be done a little bit differently and having the perspective of seeing things that were done in a lot of different ways in a lot of different laboratories helps because, you know, some laboratories are, you know, they got a really good idea. They figured something out in the process that then could be adopted at other parts of the laboratory. The biggest thing that I run into though is, well, that's the way we've always done it. Oh yeah. Because as you mentioned before, people get used to that being in that bubble on that space that they are, mm -hmm. they may not have the perspective of other ways they could do things. So they get set on, well, this is how we've done it. This is the way we've always done it. So this must be the only way we can do it. Right. So sometimes it's, it's really, it's just that. And it's having another pair of eyes come in and say, Hey, look, you don't really have to do it that way. Sometimes, you know, travelers, sometimes people coming from other laboratories, or that catalyst to be able to to, to invoke some of that change. Right. But in histology, we're not the most... Uh, Accepting of new practices. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's a very nice way to say it. Uh, compared to other areas in the laboratory, we're kind of in the caveman period in terms of some of the manual processes. Oh. And there's just a lot of automation and things that have come out over the last you know decade or so that can not only uh, reduce a lot of that variation that slows us down, mm -hmm. but it can be safer for tissue. It could be safer for us because right. we're not exposed to maybe some of the hazardous reagents and that sort of things that we had done before. There's all sorts of things that maybe have really good benefits. And most importantly, especially because of the staffing shortages, mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, it would free us up to be able to have some breathing room right. to do a lot of the other things that we're, we're used to. But it's all change management. It takes a it takes someone to accept, hey, yeah, no, we can do things differently. We don't have to do them the same way we've right. always done them. And some of the processes we do in histology really aren't going to be sustainable long term. So, for example, let's talk something that we all know in histology for the most part, right? And that's embedding. Right. We're used to that manual embedding process. Right. So every cassette that comes out, we open that lid again. Mm -hmm. And we manually manipulate. We manually touch that tissue with our forceps. It goes on the embedding center. It goes into the base mold. All these different surfaces that it touches, mm -hmm. which potentially leads to cross-contamination. Right. Yep. Something gets stuck on the forceps or in the forcep well or on the base mold. If we're not really diligent about cleaning and paying attention to what we're doing, that could be a cross-contamination that could jeopardize a patient's diagnosis or right. even provide them with the wrong diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But it's the way we've been doing things in histology since the beginning of histology. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us, we don't know any other way. Well, now there are some new techniques and some automation and some things that are coming out that can actually really help with a lot of those things. But there's a lot of reluctance to kind of look at some of those technologies. And it's, right. it's that's not new. I mean, we did the same thing when automated cover slippers were coming out. You used yeah. to hear all the time, right? That, ah, oh, it can never cover slip as good as me. Um, <laughs> it can cover slip as good as me because uh, yeah. my problems are crazy. <laughs> it, I talk to, I do a lot of presentations at some of the state meetings. I talk to some of the folks that may have been around for a long time, you know, mm -hmm. 40 or plus years in the industry. You know, they still remember having to sharpen their reusable microtome blades. What? And, you know, know, yeah. That. Yeah. That you literally, you would get a, it was a big blade and you would literally sharpen it and you would use that blade for the whole day. There wasn't the disposable blades like we're all used to for the most oh, part. Wow. Now. Can you imagine going back to that? I but could. at one point that was all oh, crazy. A disposable microtone blades. No way. Right. Uh, no, but listen, the fact that you're saying that because my boss um, at the Derm lab, cause he was like one of the first, actually uh, he was, he's a nurse practitioner and he opened up a, um, uh, derm office he has several now and he was the first to have like an in-house lab so because you know he owns everything he wanted to cut down on costs so he would uh -huh. literally tell us like you shouldn't be using but one or two blades a day i'm like yeah. how i'm like i can't just use one blade the whole day and, and, and was that one of those laboratories that also had probably like a 30 year old tissue processor that's oh, another yeah. one of those no, okay. yes, oh, it has, it has um, we have the tissue processor with a magnet. It was, yeah. we have to put it on there. And then those, um, those things are workhorses, yeah. but 
Can you imagine going to any other part of the laboratory, like general chemistry, blood bank, or anything else, oh, and see them using a piece of equipment that yeah, is old. older than some of the techs that might be in the laboratory? I cannot. It's really only in histology that you kind of see that. Yeah. And it, once again, going back to kind of the beginning of our conversation, it amazes me because, you know, they're putting, you know, blood, it's, it's not, it's not unimportant. It's very important to test those blood samples correctly too. Right. <laughs> but they're putting all that stuff on, it, you know, if it lasts five to seven years, that's a long time for that part of the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You go into histology and you, you hear jokes about it all the time. You know, they have the magnet processor that's yeah. 30 plus years old, or they have an embedding center or a, an H and E stainer that's, you know, maybe 15, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people aren't even, they don't even have cars that old. Uh, like, that oh, this is good for the water bath be old or like, this is still good condition or, you know, yeah. yeah. They, they, and, they're not and we're using bad. that on people's irretrievable tissue samples and histology. So those are the types of things I was talking about. We, you know, it's not sustainable long-term. Right. I always joke that, that, you know, we kind of get away with it because no one out there knows what we really do. Right. But the general public kind of knew that their GI biopsy <laughs> wired someone with a pair of forceps to individually embed that into a paraffin block in order to get my diagnosis. I think they would kind of freak out a little bit. I think it's so like if it's, if it's not broke the, or if it's not yeah. broke or something, don't fix it or, yeah. The Histotechs are very, uh, you know, we, there's a lot of ingenuity. We, yeah. we, find, we find a lot of ways to work around things that aren't quite right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to our detriment, because the more we make those things work, the less likely we are to get things uh, changed or improved in some cases. Yeah. Like you said, if they're like, well, it hasn't broke yet, it's still working. So it's still working. Yeah. So yeah, yeah we, histology is a very interesting a very unique uh, part of the laboratory. Uh, I love it. I'm still been in, in the, the industry for a really long time. I think it's really important, but mm -hmm. there's definitely things we can do. We can uh, do to, to make it better. Even in my Durham lab, um, we used to use like the crock pot to do like yeah. some. Um, <laughs> for, for antigen retrieval or something like that with ice. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's so crazy because like that, I guess like that's when I learned, I'm thinking like, oh, you know, we're using the crock pot because I didn't know any better. I'm just, yeah. you know, it's like my second job. And like, this, like, this is just, normal. Everyone does that. Oh, we got a crock pot. And then we turn, we, and we got like the, um, the slides and then like the energy tree, we'll, we'll put like a little circle around it. And like, you know, we're doing everything manually. Like, oh, this, it takes forever in a day, but this is how we're supposed to do it. And yep. then you go to a different, and that's the reason for traveling. Go to a different lab. Oh, this just made my life easier. I don't have to sit up here and hand write the cassettes anymore because yeah. now we have a cassette printer or I don't have to manually cover slip my slides because we have, you know, an automatic, you know, pr thing that yeah. can automatic cover slipper or we have a, a block warmer and, you know, it melts yeah. the paraffin. Anything that's going to yep. make our life easier. But before, some of, everything yeah. all cool. Yeah. For some of those things seem so simple. Like you mentioned, like the cassette printer. Mm-hmm. You think, ah, oh, it's just a cassette printer. The but number of errors that that one piece of machinery like reduces because, yeah. you know, we, we get busy and, you know, we talk about employee burnout and we're all crazy mm -hmm. and everything else. And, you know, next thing a six becomes a nine or we transpose, right. an eight and a one, you know, there's all these things that could happen. And just a simple thing like a cassette printer uh, can eliminate a lot of that. that. So, yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's Let's talk about the employee um, burnout. Um, I know you did an article on um, employee burnout that I was looking at. And um, and it says that they can start implementing measures to reduce the workload, such as hiring additional staff. This is often easier said than done. But um, in the, the staffing shortages. Um, so what do you think? Um, what can be I know we talk about what's beneficial as far as the you know, as far as getting more staff, but. Just say for people or just say for labs that have like a high turnover rate, not because of staffing issues, um, staffing issues, but maybe because of the work environment. Um, how can what do you think uh, employers can do um, to help to retain um, you know, employees and not, you know, as far as employee burnout? You think that maybe is a, a concern, too, because it's not just always, you know, there's just no employee, but a lot of people may leave, too, for yes. whatever reason. Yeah. So you're right. The employee shortage thing is is something that's been going on for a couple of decades, and there's no way 
we're going to solve that issue tomorrow. It's just, right. it's not possible. The, the, we don't have the resources and the capacity to do it. So we have to develop some ways to, like you said, retain good staff right. and uh, alleviate some of this pressure. The first thing is look at the processes that you have. Uh, there's a lot of ways, sometimes little small things that can end up saving minutes, a half an hour or an hour a day mm -hmm. that doesn't take a lot to change. You know, some things are really small. Some things are going to be big. Maybe they're going to cost money. Maybe it might be a piece of new equipment or something. But we can always start with the small things first. And when we're talking about continuous improvement, mm -hmm. that's where you want to start. The small, simple, low-hanging, but high-value sort of things first. Right. So that's the first thing. And my what I always do and when I talk to people, we can call it the Gemba walk uh, in uh, the lingo terms. Mm -hmm. But it's literally just walking through the process with the people that are doing it every day, mm -hmm. realizing what they're actually doing, what they're literally doing. Sometimes the SOP doesn't always match. You right. want to make sure that those things match. So right. what's really going on, what are the obstacles that are making it difficult for the person to do the job efficiently? And what are some of the suggestions that the people doing that work every day may have to try to do things a little bit better? Mm -hmm. And then you slowly implement some of those things. Right. And the way that helps is not only does it help free up some time, hopefully, so you can start getting that breathing room, mm -hmm. but it also hopefully if you have your processes really well, it'll reduce the learning curve for bringing new people in. So okay. instead of someone new coming in and not knowing your environment, not knowing your processes and it taking them six to eight months and really struggle to learn and to get up to speed, right. if your processes are really nailed down and they're really good and they're tight and they're simple and they're air, you know, they're airproof. Mm -hmm. That person may be able to come in in just two or three months and be happy and be able to do that. So right. that's one part, looking at our processes, self-reflection, realizing right. we can do things better. But the third and the most important thing is, is show a real appreciation for the people that are there. That I agree. Really, yeah, we, we forget about that all the time. And, you know, to be a histotech and to work in the area that we do, there, it already requires a certain type of person that is detail oriented and has a good, strong work ethic and knows the importance of the work that they do. Mm -hmm. They want to do a good job. And they try really, really hard to do a good job to the point right. where sometimes they're burning themselves out in order to do, do a good job. And sometimes just acknowledging the fact that like, hey, you know, I see you. I like, I know you're really working hard. And it mm -hmm. doesn't mean let's have a pizza party. That's kind of the running joke, right? Yeah, I think I've seen that. I saw, I saw you wrote, you write that in one of your blogs. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's, that's always the easy thing. It was like, oh, you know, they do a good job or there's people are not happy. And they're like, well, right. let's throw a couple of slices of pizza or some ice cream at them. Right. Now, don't get me wrong. I love pizza. I'm still and ice down cream. for it. I'm yeah, still, I'm still down, down for, for it. I, I love all that <laughs> stuff too. But that can't be your primary mechanism to acknowledge people. It's got to be more uh, really personal and acknowledging that the work that they're doing matters, right. uh, that the job that they're doing matters, and that you appreciate the work. And it sounds really silly and kind of like, oh, pff, yeah, you know, sort of thing. And, right. you know, and the other part of that and showing the appreciation. Sometimes we need that, though. Sometimes yeah. some, and that's like, the minimum. That's yeah. the minimum you can do to really yeah. make people feel like what they're doing is worthwhile. The right. secondary part is, is look, is, is, I hate to say it, part of it is salary, but a lot of it is time. Mm -hmm. Like one of the biggest things, one of the things I work with laboratories is you can't make your staff feel guilty because they want to take a day off. Right. If your processes and, or your laboratory situation isn't to the point where someone can't take a day off because they're right. sick or someone can't take a day off because they have to go do something with their kids and they feel or guilty family, or they, they want to take a vacation. Guilty. Yeah. And what happens, unfortunately, is when when people are feeling really, you know, uh, stressed and everything mm -hmm. about that, too. Let's say you have to take a day off because you really are sick or right. you have a family. What happens in those situations, that person comes back to work the next day and their co-workers are even giving them the glare and giving them because right. while right. they were gone, they really struggled. Making and, them feel guilty for for taking a day off for whatever reason yes. that, that reason may be. Yeah. And, and part of leadership and part of setting up the laboratory has got to be creating an environment where that's not the case. Mm -hmm. People, time. Uh, the only thing that we can't you know, get we back, limited, we can't get it back. It's time. Mm -hmm. And people need to have their time in order to feel refreshed. 
right. in order to be able to come back and work 100% or 110%. Right. And if we don't have that time, uh, our productivity and everything just starts to dwindle. So those two pieces are kind of, that helps in both large. Get your processes in place so that mm -hmm. you can give your people at least some time so that they don't feel guilty when they're mm -hmm. out. And if you can do those sorts of things, people are going to want to stay in that environment. That's a great. You know, they're going to want to stay. So yeah, that's a I, great point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely a great point. And if you can, you can give them a, a, a raise here and there. That's always just that's nice even better. money. Yeah. Money's always good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. I want to I want to add to that. I think another uh, piece would also be um, as far as just employee to employee, uh, you know, your 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 counterparts, because um, we all want to make sure we, you know, to alleviate, you know, burnout, too. Let's all make sure we're pulling our weight because, yes. um, you know, bur employee burnout can also mean that if it's like several of several of you guys and you know you feeling like you know the next person isn't really pulling their weight but you don't know how uh you don't know how to tell them that or you know you tell management and management you know doesn't really they yeah. don't see it so you don't want to you know make a big issue about it so it, it ends up becoming an issue if you you know tell everyone else but not either a maybe tell the person or b um you know just you know, actually just uh, go to management without it being like, you know, uh, I'm just, I'm being vindictive and telling, but yeah. maybe, maybe pulling your own weight. But as far as another thing is um, a lot of employees, they burn themselves, they burn themselves out because they want to go, it's great to go above and beyond, but when you just do it constantly to where, you know, if you need help and you turn down help, and, you know, no, I got it. I got it. Cause you don't want to feel like that you can't do, you know, you don't want anyone to think anything of you that you always need help or whatever the case may be. Sometimes you can be, you know, your, it can be your own fault because you are not saying, speaking up and saying, Hey, I need help. Or could you help me with this? Or, you know, I'm, I'm falling behind or I'm going to be leaving soon. And, you know, could you pick up where I left off all about communication and, and, everyone working together to making sure that, you know, we're not going to be the best of friends and like, you know, everything, but as, as long as we know that, Hey, I see that, you know, you may be struggling. I can help you. You, you know, it's just speaking up and saying, Hey, I need help. So sometimes you can be um, the reason why you have, you know, burnout. Yeah, it's a great point. And it, it, it it's very important. The laboratory ultimately is a team. You know, mm -hmm. no one's going to, no one's doing everything by themselves. By There's themselves. a lot of different moving parts and things like that. And we're all kind of cogs in that machine. So you're absolutely right. Ask for help when you need to have help. And also if you have time, offer to help. Uh, right. It's a two way offer. street, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you want to be able uh, to be a team player and those things get recognized, you know, right. a simple thank you and that sort of thing when someone needs help and that, and that, and uh, the other part of it is it, it helps you gain the perspective of what everyone else is doing. Is doing. Uh, I know the, the yeah. first thing when laboratories really start to struggle and the, the anxiety starts to creep up. If you have multiple shifts, you see it right away where like the shifts start, you know, first shift doesn't do anything. Second shift doesn't do anything. Third <laughs> shift doesn't do anything. Right. And it's, be it's because they don't have the perspective. They're not there during those shifts. And it's really easy when things are going bad to like, play the to, blame to, to pity each to yeah pity yeah to be like that oh, just, that that blame just, game. a downward spiral it just makes things worse it makes people more anxious and then mm -hmm. like you said you, then you may get reluctance it was like well i don't want to help third shift or right. i don't want to help first shift or right. you know we're, we're doing too much whereas if you could like you mentioned keep the communication channels open mm -hmm. uh, make sure you work at a team and a lot of that is facilitated from the leadership level yeah you know you, you can't have all your histotechs, you know, they, they have their jobs to do and everything else. They also can't be the ones that are managing each other all the time. Too. Exactly. That's the reason why you have a supervisor and you have a lab manager. And once again, it goes back to also having the perspective from them too. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes as histotechs, when we're on the bench and we're grinding and everything is really busy uh, and we, it's easy for us to be like, the supervisor's not doing anything for me. Right. Uh, but sometimes it's because a supervisor has to work the bench too, and they can't they they can't be in the round the lab. They can't be doing all the managing things. Uh, you know, I, I was at a laboratory recently where 
it takes them away from the managing part of right. it. Right. So uh, it, it really does uh, keep your uh, keep your uh, mind open uh, to uh, helping each other out, and that you know keep your perspectives open and that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it starts at the leadership level, and you know you might be able to you might not be getting new equipment, you might not be getting new headcount. Right. Those two things you you may not have any control over. Right. The the workload may still be growing. All of this, the other things may be happen that you don't have any control over. But the one thing you do have control over and that you can adjust is the processes within your environment, within your mm -hmm. laboratory. And if you're and some sometimes people are like, well, oh, that only going to save me five minutes or ten minutes. But that adds up. You that know, adds that up every five, day, every yep. week. Yep. And yeah. then also too, you know, in you know, in regards like you actually can take a break. Like, cause a lot yeah. of people, they'll say, oh, I didn't take a lunch and I didn't take a break. And, you know, and, and it just felt like, take that, that kills, time to take a yeah, break. Yeah, that kills me when I hear that. And, 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 but I was actually one of those types of people too. Yeah, I get because, like that too sometimes. Yeah. I can't take my if, last break or. If I get up out of this microtome, these blocks aren't going to cut themselves. If I get right. up out of the seat at the manual embedding station, these blocks aren't going to bed themselves, you know? So you're like team player, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so you forego your break. Well, next thing you know, you're foregoing your break every day. Right. Now, maybe it's also you're foregoing your lunch, lunch. or you're grabbing something. Well, that's not healthy for you either. Not that's mm -hmm. going to lead to burnout. Right. So you, you have to be, you have to be able to take care of yourself so that you're at that high productivity level that you need. Uh, and in some cases, like, you know, some people are like, oh, well, that person's being selfish because they're taking their break. No, nope. everyone should be taking the <laughs> everyone break. Everyone should take a break. Yeah. yeah. And, and if the situation and the processes in the laboratory are such that you can't take a break or you're feeling pressured that you can't take a lunch, mm -hmm. that it's already bad. All you're doing by not taking your break and not taking your lunch is throwing a Band-Aid over a situation that needs to right. be fixed. Right. And we, it's only going to work down from there. Uh, right. You're going to start to resent the situation. And like you said, you know, how do you keep people from, from leaving? Well, that's mm -hmm. one of the things that would get me to leave. If I'm not yeah. happy, I can't take a break. I can't take a lunch. I'm getting I run can't take the a day ground. off. I can't. can't take a day off without my coworkers glaring at me the next right. day or, or getting heat from the supervisor or, right. you know, saying, or, you know, I have a one-time event and the supervisor tells me I can't take the day off because, mm -hmm. you know, two other people are already taking that day off. You know, those are situations that lead to unhappiness and the use right. of time mm -hmm. that uh, I'm going to, you know, I might look for somewhere else to go. Yeah. You know, if you, you, it's easier said than done. Change management, all that stuff, process changes. It takes a lot of work. It takes, it takes time. Good. Yeah. But a little bit of pain up front, uh, temporary pain up front to work through those processes can sometimes alleviate chronic pain in the long term and you end up being way better off. So, yeah. You know, I agree with you. All the things that you can change, appreciate your employees and and work on your process changes, even if it's small things, uh, can lead to a lot of world of good at the end of the day. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, we're going to get into um, your studying um, as far as the study tips that you have on your page. Um, I did a poll on my YouTube and I asked them um, what would be like the main things that, you know, they would want me to talk to you about, which is the study guide. And you guys, um, feel free to leave a question down in the chat for Josh, and we will definitely get to the uh, to the questions. And um, so, yeah, let's go over your your his, your study, um, okay. your courses. Uh, I see that you're starting some new courses. Uh, you putting it on your on your blog on your page. And one of the courses is the basics of conventional um, tissue processing, histotech exam prep, basis of formula and fixation, the basis of manual tissue embedding, and the basis of tissue grossing. Now, uh, what made you want to start um, doing some prepping courses? Because um, are you familiar, like, as far as, like, what people are, you know, are saying about, like, what are the hardest thing, you know, on the ASCP? Because I have a lot of videos on my channel uh, how to study for the ASCP and what to expect when taking the ASCP and what to study um, for the ASCP. Um, are you like, what made you decide to, to say, hey, I want to start, you know, providing courses or some type of like uh, study material for uh, for students or histologists? Yeah. 
So the the first thing, uh, so yeah, some of the ones that are up there are continuing education type things. Uh, but mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm really working on right now is what you're talking about the uh, a whole uh, platform just for um, prepping to take the HT exam. Um, I obviously had to take the HT exam at one point myself, and I took the HTL as well. So I've lived through it personally, and I did it for, uh, through the other route because I already had a degree. So I didn't go through a formal histology program. So that, you know, that could be a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. you get the Frida Carson book and you got to learn a lot of those things. And I was in the laboratory, so I had some, some hands-on experience too. But like I said, we didn't use all the fixatives or anything else. So one of the things is I want to be able to have a, a really uh, good resource, a one-stop shop, if you will, for folks who may want to come in and take this exam prep. So when this is all completed, I will be going through uh, following the ASCP guidelines and following and having sections, e each piece in its own section. Uh, I also plan to have some cheat sheet sort of things uh, with that too. Um, some kind of interactive things for formal and fixation to help go through as a study guide, um, some of those sorts of things. Uh, and I'm also going to be having some sample pr uh, test prep, uh, some example tests that you can do. On the continuing education side, the reason why I want to start with the basics is because that's really the foundation that everything else in histology is built on, right? Right. And as we mentioned earlier, a lot of the folks getting into histology, maybe they were a lab aide, you know, they're getting kind of thrown in and they learn how to do enough to do the job, but they're missing a lot of the key basics. Fixation. It's amazing the things that I uh, find out folks don't know about fixation and how important mm -hmm. it is and that sort of thing. Tissue processing. Tissue processing is kind of an air, a, a major area of interest for me. Mm -hmm. um, I actually developed, and it'll be included in here too, um, a guideline to help people update their tissue processing protocols. Okay. Because I find out all the time in laboratories, you know, they may be using an eight hour long tissue processing protocol for biopsies that could be done in, you know, an hour and a half or a two hour on a oh. conventional processor, but okay. they don't know any better because this is how they've always done it. Right. You know, and, you know, just something as simple as updating a tissue processing protocol may save them four, five, six hours in the processing cycle, but they just haven't done it because they don't they don't know that that's an option for them. So so I, I'm starting with a lot of these uh, that, that I'm uh, do courses that I'm doing myself uh, from the basics to give that strong foundation that then they, we can build into more advanced topics uh, later on. I actually have a new instructor that's going to be coming on. Um, she is working on some of her content materials uh, that will be on the, the site as well. Okay. And that's going to be a little bit different flavor. That's going to be looking at things from the quality uh, management system, uh, validations, uh, the safety, because we all have to have those safety as part of our continuing education credits. Yep. And those things that uh, this uh, in individual, this new instructor that I'm bringing on is a, is a, does that and does it really well. Um, so we will be having some of those on as, uh, as well. A lot of these newer ones will be popping up here. Uh, we're working on them now. I'm going to kind of launch them at Moss here pretty soon uh, okay. because I'm actually I will actually have a booth at the uh, NSH this year in Baltimore. It's actually okay. booth 1302. If you are happen to go to to NSH, NSH. Uh, where's it, you said it's in Baltimore this yeah. year? It's in Baltimore this year. Uh, so uh, if you're planning on coming to NSH, uh, and I always encourage people. Uh, to participate and and to join NSH and to go to the NSH events, mm -hmm. uh, not only from the educational aspect, but from also the networking. The networking is really aspect. good. Uh, we're not a large community <laughs> as Histotechs, uh, but it's awesome and it helps and you, you learn a lot and it gives you, uh, you know, a lot of resources networking wise and everything else later down the line. And if you run through the exhibit hall, you know, you'll learn a lot of new equipment and new things that are coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, you'll be able to come visit hopefully our booth as well. Uh, so in preparation for NSH, uh, we'll be launching several new courses. Uh, okay. the HD exam prep is something that I'm working hard on now. Um, I hope to possibly have it launched by NSH, uh, but if not, uh, it'll be launched before the end of the year. Uh, and in fact, um, the goal was, uh, to try to get up to 50 courses launched before the end of the year. So oh, wow. it's a pretty lofty goal. Yeah, uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah we really 
hope to be able to provide and everything will be related to histology in some way either you know directly or a bit indirectly in terms of maybe some of the quality management stuff and and uh that sort of thing but uh uh yeah we we, we hope to have them uh, up and going so um in terms of one of the th reasons why i wanted to do this is part of it was affordability um okay. The, the classes, uh, we, we have it set up and I'm actually looking and, and uh, if anyone has any feedback on what might be good for them, I'm happy to take it. I really okay. want to make this something that's a worthwhile. This is kind of a labor of love for me at this point. It's not about the, the money. It's just about basically covering a lot of the costs to it. So yeah. individual course, you can see there, it's going to be around okay, 599. 599. Yeah, I like that. That's um. I'll, I'll throw out a little uh, uh, spoiler. I, I will probably have, you know, discounts and coupon things going from here and there uh, okay. to reduce that a little bit. I am also have right now, you can sign up for an annual uh, and have access to everything. So all the courses, as many as you want to take. Um, and uh, that's at a low price as well. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I'm considering and working on right now is also uh, creating the app uh, so that you would be able to actually take courses directly through your phone. Uh, oh, that's cool. app. So I want to make it easy to access. I want to make it affordable. affordable. And I want to <laughs> make sure that the content is really relevant uh, that people uh, want to go through. Um, everything, all the courses that you'll be on here, uh, they're all, I have a, my, I'm approved. A provider through PACE. So they're all uh, uh, credit worthy through ASCP. Uh, okay. And uh, I am also loading them all through CE broker for the folks that are in Florida. Uh, so they'll all be accessible and uh, qualified for credit through CE broker as well. So well, that's actually thank you, Josh, uh, for doing that, because um, like you and I talked earlier, uh, it can get a pretty pricey trying to take individual courses um, for the CEUs. Um, and and like I said before, you know, doing them through ASCP and doing them through CE Broker um, or, do, or doing them through uh, Lab CE. Um, and uh, as, as far as like ASCP, like it was just taking me like all day. And I think it's a good thing. I was looking at your one of your courses here. And I, the, I like the fact that it says level basic. So in your basic, we, we could just talk about uh, this right here. Um, are you doing like covering like troubleshooting, uh, like, yep. you know, as far as like, you know, processing, delay processing, what, you know, a stain will look like, um, you know, with autolysis and um, yep. different things. And then like how many questions um, are on the quiz? Yeah. So if you if you scroll up uh, just or down, I should say okay. <laughs> opposite. Uh, so the course objectives I'll always have laid out here. Okay. Uh, so uh, in this one, uh, discussing the difference between conventional and rapid tissue processing, I'll have mm -hmm. one for uh, rapid tissue processing coming out as well. Uh, okay. Describing the next part is describing really like the variables on like the reagents, how the protocols are put together. And then, yeah, oh, okay. the final piece will be identifying and, and troubleshooting. So looking at some of the common tissue processing artifacts and that. Uh, the okay. quizzes, they're always going to be around 10 questions. Uh, okay. That's part of the, the pace uh, requirements and that sort of thing. Uh, and there's I always have a, a evaluation that's included in that. And that's an evaluation of your feedback about what the course, uh, how, what you liked and maybe didn't like about the course. Okay. Uh, because I really do want the feedback so that we can make little changes here and there. I want this to be convenient. I want it to be educational. I want it to be impactful when people take these courses uh, because, it, you know, uh, for some of us or the people that may not get to a lot of different laboratories and may mm -hmm. not get experience a lot of these sort of things, continuing education is one of those ways that we can actually uh, expand our perspectives and our horizon and, and learn some new things. So. Um, I will have, uh, yeah, the basic is so that people know that when you go into this, this is going to be a real like, uh, you know, key level basic sort of thing, like okay. training you as if you're new, uh, but I will have some kind of intermediate and some advanced courses uh, that will come up as we get into things like IHC or digital imaging and that sort of thing later on uh, down the line. So uh, okay. I have the one course is up and available uh, for people to take now. Uh, this is kind of just to, to have some so people can see like how it's set up, what's okay. coming, what to expect. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I, 
I hope to have several more launched by, uh, it's, I believe, um, August 8th is uh, the start of NSH. Okay. Uh, so we only got about a, a month, a month and a half away, a little mm -hmm. bit less than that. Oh, less, yeah, less than yeah, the month. a little bit less. So I'll have yeah. a few more uh, for that too. Uh, and um, uh, another little kind of spoiler thing, uh, if you do come by the booth, um, I'm planning to do a little, um, if you you know sign up with your email or register your e email, that sort of thing, um, to give away some uh, free class access. Oh, so that's cool. CEUs for free is never- CEUs never for free. Better. You guys cannot beat that. And if your CEUs is coming due, this is definitely you know a great thing to look into. As far as your courses, are they accessible as many times as you want whenever you pay the, the price or- is yeah. What, once you pay, you have access. You can go back and forth to the videos. Uh, okay. You don't have to complete the whole thing at once. Uh, okay. If you want to go through one objective at a time, that's absolutely fine. Uh, so uh, it's kind of uh, on demand, if you will. Uh, so you don't have to, if you don't have an hour to go through the whole thing at one time, you only have 20 minutes. Uh, that's why I'm also really looking into the potential of, of the app option. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, sometimes it's, you know, maybe you're at the gym and you can do your CEUs while you're sitting there on the at the gym on the exercise bike or, you know, try. we're all busy. Right. And right. sometimes it's just trying to fit in the little things here and there uh, that uh, can make the difference on keeping up with your CEUs. Or if you're a procrastinator, like I can be kind of. Me too. To <laughs> uh, that's the, to the last minute. <laughs> yeah. And that's the that's why I wanted to also create the. Uh, the annual uh, group so mm -hmm. that it, it that gives you access to everything. So if you are a procrastinator and suddenly you're getting, you know, two months from the time you got to turn everything in and you still got, you know, 20 courses or 20 hours of CEU to go through. I want to be able to, I've lived that. So I want to <laughs> be able to have an option where people can do a one-stop shop. And, you know, at one point, you know, I'll have more than 36 uh, courses in there. You can, take them all one right after another uh for that's one, good. one I think that's a good idea uh, yeah, one low price so um yeah like i said I, I i try to think of you know what i've gone had to go through mm -hmm. and and i and by all means i do also want to encourage you know people to really take a look at their their free options um i'm i hope histology education becomes a resource for people um, I want to make sure that it's a, something that people get a benefit out of. Uh, there is a little bit of a cost to it. I'm trying to keep that down as low as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, free is not bad either. Yeah. NSH has opportunities. Uh, there are other sometimes vendors that give away free webinars, you know. And uh, at one point, I, I will hope after I communicate with some of those folks to also share some of those things on the web page when those come up. So yeah, I'm maybe not gonna. I'm, maybe I won't get any money for it in support of the website, but it right. helps everyone. It still helps know. everyone. Yeah, yeah I and, think. Uh, um, yeah, I think you know, just like just like you, it's more of like uh, everything is not always like monetary. It's more yeah. like you know what you're giving back and what you see that may uh, you know because we can sit up here all day and say, oh, this is what it should be like this and it should be like this and I think this and I think that, but like we're actually sometimes you actually just need to like put it into action and maybe it's something that you can change and maybe something that you can start to do and and that's what i'm doing here it's like you know everything is it's because i used to be that person who would be needing help or you know need questions and now i think I'm that person that, you know, most people can actually say, okay, you know, let me ask you or what's your opinion. And, and I take pride in that because I'm only telling people from experience or what I think may be the best option. But at the end of the day, you know, you can make your own option, you know, you can choose yeah. your own decision, but just to have someone there to who can relate, um, who's been in your shoes, or maybe, you know, you want to make a change, or maybe you you, you want to just go a different way and see, okay, maybe this can work. So uh, I'm definitely, you know, I'm going to be making sure that I, um, I'll always be posting histology education, I'm um, promoting your website um, for you, and um, just making sure that people do know that your website is a resource, because you know, it takes time for things to the word of mouth to grow, you know, for yourself to be because you can 
push everything every single day and you you putting in your hard work, your blood, sweat and tears, but it takes time sometimes for, you know, that seed to become a fruit. So, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, like I'll definitely um, post uh, histology education anytime I can on my uh, social media platforms to, you know, bring that traffic to your to your website. And, you know, it's, it's resource. Yeah. And, and I, I will, of course, be doing the same. Uh, like I said, I I didn't know uh, that you had this uh, this kind of venue until yeah. I saw it through Facebook. And then, you know, now that I see it, you know, I, I will be sharing it online as well. Thank uh, you. I, I definitely appreciate you uh, taking the time and putting this uh, all together and uh, having, and, and yeah, it, schedules can be crazy. So right. <laughs> I, I got the new baby at home as and well. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. I knew, I know you're a busy person. So, and I'm pretty busy too. So it's like, you know, for you and I to go back and forth and actually make this time to actually come because I'm not, in, you know, I, it's I, the type of person I am is like, I know I can get caught up in, you know, I actually work and then I yeah. actually try to do content and edit and all this and like, and I just need downtime. And so like you, you do a lot of traveling and you have a new baby and, you know, you need downtime. So it, I think this was great that we actually, you know, took the time to actually like get everything together. So, and, and this is what this is for. We're doing this for the histology you know, community. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not on Facebook. So that's why a lot of people, they tell me, Oh, I saw you on Facebook. I'm like, cause I don't have a Facebook, but I know that probably once I do create a Facebook and be a more, I just have so many social media platforms. Sometimes just like, I just can't take another one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't blame you. I, mean, I, 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 I like that. I like Instagram and, and some yeah. of those a bit better. Uh, but, uh, yeah, right. Right now, Facebook is still kind of the king of the king of the game. So I'm king of the game. I, I actually like LinkedIn a lot because uh, you know that's a lot of uh, direct professional. You know, when it comes to the hist histotechs and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So uh, I do uh, like LinkedIn a lot as well. But uh, yeah. I need but to Facebook's how I found you. So it, it uh, served some good there for sure. I know. I know. So we're going to get into um, some questions we have. Um, we have a question from one of um, uh, one of the gang. Uh, Reem says, "I need for HT exams. I'm nervous for my exam. What are some tips um, um, for the HT exam? You have any tips for her for for the exam, like passing the exam, or taking the exam, or studying for the exam?" Yeah. So one of the things, and one of the things I always used to work with my students too is uh, know how the exam is going to be broken down. So the mm -hmm. ASCP. Uh, tells you exactly how the test is going to be broken down by the percentages for the different types of questions. Right. So for example, if I remember right off the top of my head, you know, fixation is somewhere within 10 to 15% of the total questions for the exam are fixation. Mm -hmm. If you notice on there, most of the test is going to be on your special stains, your, you know, that sort of category. Right. So I always tell people to kind of start with that and get those big hitters Right. Uh, in terms of the number of questions that are going to be on the exam, learn that stuff well. And then right. once you really kind of nail that down, go back to some of the things that you've maybe started studying first mm -hmm. uh, and have neglected for a while. Right. One of the things that always used to catch folks when they were going through is you kind of progress starting with like fixation and all that stuff first, right? And right. then you get to the end, which is the bulk of it, which is all the special stains. Special stains. Mm -hmm. By the time you've gotten all the way through there, sometimes a long time has passed you're and your brain has just gotten filled with all those special stains. Mm -hmm. So I always tell that people to go back, hit the fixatives again uh, and, and that sort of thing, because the, even if it's 10 to 15 percent. And it's one of those things that people don't always go back because they're like, oh, yeah, I did that. I knocked it all out of the park. Uh, but sometimes it was two months ago. Right. So I always tell people to start with the, the heavy hitter first, but mm -hmm. don't forget, you know, kind of before you go to take the exam, do a quick refresher of those guys like fixation. Uh, and and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, there are definitely going to be questions about the weird fixatives that you, if you're even working in a lab right now, you've probably never used and never seen. So yeah, like you know, five, yep, you got exactly. five, you got Boon, you got Ox, Oxmium right you have, uh, I mean, Healy or like all these fixatives and you never use them. Yes. 
Yeah, you'll never see them if you're working in the lab unless you're doing some like crazy research project. Oh, crazy usually. research, right. But there's going to be at least one or two of those on the exam. Uh, right. You know. Yeah, and to add. The, to add, easy. the formula is easy, but the, the other one. Yeah. yeah. To add to what you were saying um, to uh, Reem is what I normally suggest is um, in my videos is to and the reason because i didn't pass my test the first time i took it right after school because i was just i don't know what i was thinking i was just trying, <laughs> and i was like i'm not even ready but i took it and i and i failed it so the second time when i took my test i was like you know what this book is bigger than me so that's why i call frida the mom and i call the study book the daughter or sometimes i call frida the bible right yeah. so um when it came to frida what I did was I literally retaught myself because I had to, when I got to fixation, fixation, what I always teach is fixation and special stains like are the main things mm -hmm. because you're right. Once you get to special stains, you've forgotten all about fixation. So what I teach is um, take your time in fixation, right? And then do not move on. I don't care if it takes you two months to study fixation don't move to the next chapter until you're ready and also go through the whole process like mentally if you was in a lab like you know processing fixation or fixation processing you know embedding microtomy special stains if you're doing ihc or immuno and then um but i always say you know and don't schedule your test this is just my advice some people like working on the pressure they'll schedule a test for october the second and then right now is you know what july the 29th and they'll be just focusing on october the second so what i suggest is get halfway through your book and then before you know you're about to go into maybe special stains i would say then schedule your test if you if you have that time because what happens is you by the time you get the special stains and you schedule your test just say for whatever month then you have enough time to go back to fixation and it will be like a refresher for you and then you know you'll have that now it's just a refreshing a refresher time and then as you're as you're studying have your study book now it's time for the questions because you will need to actually learn frida before you actually get to those study questions because you need to remember technical notes question what makes a fixative good what makes it you know why why you shouldn't use this fixative what's inside of you know Healy's what's inside of orc what's inside of you know what makes them different you literally need to know what's inside every fixative yeah right there yeah and the the last kind of two things that I have for you too that I would always tell students is that when you're going through the exam and this is pretty much true for most exams but mm -hmm. especially true for this too mm -hmm. it's multiple choice right so if you read the question and the answer doesn't immediately pop in your head, that's okay. That's going to happen. Right. Look at your, your, the answers that they give you, the choice that you do, because you can almost always at least eliminate one or two. two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, then you can actually, once you've eliminated one or two, sometimes even that process of thinking of, oh, I can eliminate this because of X, Y, or Z. Right. That can also help trigger why the right answer might be, you know, whatever the, the situation might be. So right. help yourself out, even on the tough questions where you may not know it right off the top of your head, give yourself a higher probability of being able to get the right answer by mm -hmm. taking a time, a little bit of time and just saying, hey, I know it's not this because of this. Right. Get the ones that you know is not out the way. That's yeah. 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 And the last thing is, and you touched on it too, don't beat yourself up mm -hmm. if you don't pass the first right. time. In fact, if you look at the statistics, most people don't pass the first time of round. Right. Whether it was because they weren't ready, whether but it's it was always the pressure. Yeah, but it's it, always that that you know people. You put the pressure on yourself, and then when others know that you're taking the test, that's the pressure too. Yeah. So it's sort of like you know. Even the testing center gives you anxiety. Pressure. When you when you go into the just to, for the folks who maybe have not done it yet, when you go mm -hmm. into the testing center, because these testing centers do all sorts of different types of tests. 
It's like going into Fort Knox. Right. You have to do like a fingerprint ID. I Some know. of them, it's even like the optical. You have to put like, they do a scan of like your eyes. eyes. And then they scan you before you even walk through the door. Mm -hmm. And then they got to scan you when you walk out of the door. Yep. So even that environment kind of it's puts you in a little bit of a, And don't yeah. put out your seat. You have to raise your hand. Yep. And they give you like, it's, it's like you put your stuff in a locker when you get in here. They give you your 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 whiteboard, write stuff down here. If you need something, don't get up. Don't you can't probably talk to the next person because yeah. you're right. Someone else is taking a test for something else right right beside you. So yeah. even like that part right there is very like intimidating. So I I agree with you. Yeah. And, and the final thing that just was kind of uh, funny because uh, it happened to me and it's happened to a couple of other friends, especially one recently. Mm -hmm. um, when you get down to when you're done taking the test and you're doing your final submission. Mm -hmm. I did one of those things like, oh my gosh, uh, all right, submit. And I'm going to see if I pass. Because it'll tell right. you if you, you pass right then. Mm -hmm. um, I was expecting to hit it once and then like that. You actually have to hit it like two or three times. Two or three you times. Go through, like two or three screens. <laughs> so by the time yeah. of that, like, just tell me if I pass. Uh, <laughs> so just know that going in that you're going to have one or two screens to have to hit okay on hit okay. Before you, you pass. So uh, <laughs> uh, I, I visited a friend that just went through and uh, did the test and he fell into that same trap too, where he was like, uh, submit, and then, submit. and then, yeah, yeah. Then submit again and then okay again. And then, then it finally, and then finally, you know, yeah. Um, so. Now before we, before we go, Josh, I just want to ask you, um, if you could give my uh, audience um, a piece of advice, um, you know, for uh, for histology as far as you know entering into the field of histology and why um, this would probably be you know a a great field for them to be in, uh, what piece of advice would you like to give my audience who's watching? Because you know we can look at someone like you know you who have accomplished like so many things and worn you know you wear so many hats and but you started off like me as a histotech you started off like the person who's watching um and we all have different avenues you know that we have that we're going to walk and what path we're going to walk so what type of advice would you give my audience for especially for new people who are you know wanting to start histology wanting to do a career change or you know who are who watches me and say you know what like i want to do it but i'm afraid like what piece of advice would you give them to to be a histotech or at yeah. least start the, start the journey of being a histotech yeah and you're absolutely right i started in histology just starting with the sessioning i didn't know anything and then you eventually learn so my biggest piece of advice is don't let intimidation stop you right uh, because we talk ourselves out of so many things and so many opportunities mm -hmm. because we may be a little bit intimidated you're not expected to know everything about everything right. all at one time you'll learn it and it's not rocket science like right. this is all things that are very learnable redundant <laughs> redundant yeah uh -huh. and you know keep your mind open to always being on the lookout for new things right the great thing about histology is you may start doing one thing and then in a few minutes, you know, a few months later, you might be doing something else and something else. And all of those new things are going to be a little bit intimidating in the, in the first, mm -hmm. I, when I train people how to do microtomy, like I could sometimes see the fear in their face <laughs> because microtomy can be intimidating, right? You've got a real sharp yeah. blade in front of you and you're right. cutting someone's tissue and we've right. just scared the daylights out of you saying, yeah. don't cut into it too much. Don't, because, don't <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it can be intimidating. Take your time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's worth it. Uh, the intimidation will go away in no time uh, right. because like you just mentioned, a lot of the things are redundant. You'll mm -hmm. do that hundreds of times a day. You'll get good right. at it really pretty quickly. But right. that's my biggest piece of advice is, don't let intimidation scare you away or slow you down from learning something new, mm -hmm. trying something new, trying to make improvements on something, even though someone may say this is the way we've done it for 30 years mm -hmm. or whatever the case might be, because everything is going to widen your perspective. It's going to make you more valuable to the, you know, the team that you're on. It's going to mm -hmm. make you more valuable for you know your work environment and your or opportunities outside of maybe the laboratory you start at mm -hmm. um, it's all everything always kind of can build on the next thing but if you uh, let intimidation scare you out of 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 trying right uh, taking the next step 
or learning something new, you're going to be in the same place and you're going to get stuck there. Right. And that can lead to regrets and resentment. And right. Yeah. And you're taking uh, the you know, joy out of what, you know, what you're doing. Yeah. And you'll find sometimes you'll do something new and you're like, no, I don't really like that. Right. That, that's great because now you know something that you don't really that you like. you don't like. Right. And you'll learn the things that you really do like. Uh, and there's a lot of different directions you can go with histology. Uh, I know a lot of folks that maybe started in histology and eventually became a PA or right. Or, or a pathologist, or mm -hmm. they went to nursing, or they are a hospital administrator, or they're a lab manager, or they went to the vendor side, and now they're a product manager or an application right. specialist. So there's lots of cool opportunities out there. And uh, the only one that's going to hold you back from, and this is going to sound really philosophical, weird, but the only one's really going to hold you back is going to be yourself it's and yourself. limiting yourself from being able to take those opportunities and learn new things. So that's my number one thing. Don't let all the things intimidate you. It's going to seem scary at first, but everything seems scary at first. I, know. I, I got a, a daughter who, you know, sometimes she's a baby. She doesn't really know that yet. She gets head first <laughs> off the couch and uh, oh before, before she learns, you know, to put her feet first, uh, everyone should have that level of just, you know, try things out and don't right. let intimidation hold you back. I definitely agree with you. Yeah, good, good advice, Josh. I really, I really agree with you. I really, uh, even with me, you know, doing my show and me, you know, becoming a content creator, um, you know, every time I maybe go live or I have to put out content, you know, people could think, oh, you know, is this just easy? But it really isn't because you have yeah. to literally think of just like you know, with your website, you have to think of what's engaging, what is going to keep. You're doing it, yes, because that's what you love to do. But also, too, um, you have to because people's uh, attention span is very short. So you yeah. actually have to like what is what do they like or enjoy? Are you putting something out? Are you writing something or you're speaking and people are going to be engaged? Um, and also, too, you know, we are providing like, you know, a service like, you know, are you learning? Because I'm learning with you guys so that's the reason why i created tech talk you know i really appreciate you coming on the show and i really appreciate all the valuable information um that you have provided to us and thank you guys so much for watching and listening um to tech talk and if you have any questions that you will want me to uh, relay back to josh i definitely can and you guys do not forget to check out uh, histologyeducation.com and Josh, we really appreciate you being part of Tech Talk. You really have, uh, you know, gave us, given us so much great value, valuable information. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I can't thank you enough for, uh, you know, putting this kind of avenue together for people to talk about something like histology. Uh, and I uh, really appreciate you taking the time, having me on. And uh, yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be uh, promoting the tech talk. Hopefully, I, get, get that communication going and you get more to. people interested because uh, we need them. We need yeah, to if you, yeah, definitely keep in touch. And if you, I would love to have you back on the show whenever you are free again. And um, if you know anyone who would you know would want to be a part of. Uh, tech talk and we can do like a panel we can just keep reaching um you know other people to know about histology and give them a space i'm creating a space for them because everyone can't make it to you know the conferences or everyone's you know they're working and this is like just a good space that you know i wanted to create where we can come on and talk about histology and we you know what's happening in real life behind the scenes of what we may not see so yeah. if you if you know anyone who wants to be on the show, definitely give them, you know, my information. And I really appreciate you coming on and taking the time to talk with us. Yep, no problem. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the question uh, from uh, Reem. And uh, yeah, yeah. If, there, if there's any other questions, yeah, uh, uh, feel free to reach out. Always happy to to help out or answer as best I can. And if I don't know the answer, I'll hunt it down. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah, so. Thank you, Josh. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you, Josh. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. All right. Bye.